angles and fired it as soon as we fixed, to let the Indians know, if any were within hearing, that we had such pieces. And thus our fort, if such a magnificent name might be given to so miserable a stockade, was finished in a week, though it rained so hard every other day that the men could not work. This gave me occasion to observe that, when men are employed, they are best contented, for on the days they worked they were good-natured and cheerful, and with a consciousness of having done a good day's work, they spent the evening jollily. But on our idle days they were mutinous and quarrelsome, finding fault with their pork, the bread, etc., and in continual ill-humor which put me in mind of a sea captain, whose rule it was to keep his men constantly at work, and, when his mate once told him that they had done everything and there was nothing further to employ them about, Oh, he says, make them scour the anchor. This kind of fort, however contemptible, is a sufficient defense against Indians, who have no cannon, Finding ourselves now posted securely, and having a place to retreat to on occasion, we ventured out in parties to scour the adjacent country. We met with no Indians, but we found the places in the neighboring hills where they had lain to watch our proceedings. There was an art in their contrivance of those places that seems worth mention. It being winter, a fire was necessary for them but a common fire on the surface of the ground would by its light have discovered their position at a distance they had therefore dug holes in the ground about three feet in diameter and somewhat deeper we saw where they had with their hatchets cut off the charcoal from the sides of burnt logs lying in the woods with these coals they had made small fires in the bottom of the holes and we observed among the weeds and grass the prints of their bodies made by laying all around with their legs hanging down in the holes to keep their feet warm which with them is an essential point this kind of fire so managed could not discover them either by its flame light sparks or even smoke it appeared that their number was not great and it seems they saw we were too many to be attacked by them with prospect of advantage. We had our own chaplain, a zealous Presbyterian minister, Mr. Beatty, who complained to me that the men did not generally attend his prayers and exhortations. When they enlisted, they were promised, besides pay and provisions, a gill of rum a day which was punctually served out to them half in the morning and the other half in the evening. And I observed they were as punctual in attending to receive it. Upon which I said to Mr. Beatty, It is, perhaps, below the dignity of your profession to act as a steward of the rum, but if you were to deal it out and only just after prayers, you would have them all about you. He liked the thought undertook the office, and, with the help of a few hands to measure out the liquor, executed it to satisfaction, and never were prayers more generally and more punctually attended. So that I thought this method preferable to the punishment inflicted by some military laws for non-attendance on divine service. I had hardly finished this business and got my fort well stored with provisions when I received a letter from the governor, acquainting me that he had called the assembly and wished my attendance there. If the posture of affairs on the frontiers was such that my remaining there was no longer necessary. My friends, too, of the assembly, pressing me by their letters to be, if possible, at the meeting, and my three intended forts being now completed, and the inhabitants contented to remain on their farms under that protection, I resolved to return. The more willingly, as a New England officer, Colonel Clapham, experienced in Indian war, being on a visit to our establishment, consented to accept the command." I gave him a commission, and, parading the garrison, had it read before them, and introduced him to them as an officer who, from his skill in military affairs, was much more fit to command them than myself. 
and, giving them a little exhortation, took my leave. I was escorted as far as Bethlehem, where I rested a few days to recover from the fatigue I had undergone. The first night, being in a good bed, I could hardly sleep. It was so different from my hard lodging on the floor of our hut at Ganadin, wrapped only in a blanket or two. While at Bethlehem, I inquired a little into the practice of the Moravians. Some of them had accompanied me, and all were very kind to me. I found they worked for a common stock, ate at common tables, and slept in common dormitories, great numbers together. In the dormitories I observed loopholes at certain distances all along just under the ceiling, which I thought judiciously placed for change of air. I was at their church, where I was entertained with good music, the organ being accompanied with violins, hot boys, flutes, clarinets, etc. I understood that their sermons were not usually preached to mixed congregations of men, women, and children, as is our common practice, but that they assembled sometimes the married men, at other times their wives, then the young men, the young women, and the little children, each division by itself. The sermon I heard was to the latter, who came in and were placed in rows on benches, the boys under the conduct of a young man, their tutor, and the girls conducted by a young woman. The discourse seemed well adapted to their capacities, and was delivered in a pleasing, familiar manner, coaxing them, as it were, to be good. They behaved very orderly, but looked pale and unhealthy, which made me suspect they were kept too much within doors and not allowed sufficient exercise. I inquired concerning the Moravian marriages, whether the report was true that they were by lot. I was told that lots were used only in particular cases, that generally, when a young man found himself disposed to marry, he informed the elders of his class, who consulted the elder ladies that governed the young women. As these elders of the different sexes were well acquainted with the tempers and dispositions of their respective pupils, they could best judge what matches were suitable, and their judgments were generally acquiesced in. But if, in, for example, it should happen that two or three young women were found to be equally proper for the young man, the lot was then recurred to. I objected. If the matches are not made by mutual choice of the parties, some of them may chance to be very unhappy. And so they may, answered my informer, if you let the parties choose for themselves, which indeed I could not deny. Being returned to Philadelphia, I found the association went on swimmingly. The inhabitants that were not Quakers, having pretty generally come into it, formed themselves into companies, and chose their captains, lieutenants, and ensigns according to the new law. Dr. B. visited me and gave me an account of the pains he had taken to spread a general good liking to the law, and ascribed much to those endeavors. I had had the vanity to ascribe all to my dialogue. However, not knowing but that he might be in the right, I let him enjoy his opinion, which I take to be generally the best way in such cases. The officers' meeting chose me to be the colonel of the regiment, which I this time accepted. I forgot how many companies we had, but we paraded around twelve hundred well-looking men, with a company of artillery, who had been furnished with six brass field pieces, which they had become so expert in the use of as to fire twelve times in a minute. The first time I reviewed the regiment, they accompanied me to my house, and would salute me with some rounds fired before my door, which shook down and broke several glasses of my electrical apparatus. And my new honor proved not much less brittle for all our commissions were soon after broken by a repeal of the law in England. During this short time of my colonelship, being about to set out on a journey to Virginia, the officers of my regiment took it into their heads that it would be proper for them to escort me out of town as far as the lower ferry, 
Just as I was getting on horseback, they came to my door, between thirty and forty, mounted, and all in their uniforms. I had not been previously acquainted with the project, or I should have prevented it, being naturally averse to the assuming of state on any occasion. And I was a good deal chagrined at their appearance, as I could not avoid their accompanying me. What made it worse was that, as soon as we began to move, they drew their swords and rode with them naked all the way. Somebody wrote an account of this to the proprietor, and it gave him great offense. No such honor had been paid him when in the province, nor to any of his governors, and he said it was only proper to princes of the blood royal, which may be true for aught I know, who was, and still am, ignorant of the etiquette of such classes. This silly affair, however, greatly increased his rancor against me, which was before not a little, on account of my conduct in the assembly respecting the exemption of his estate from taxation, which I had always opposed very warmly, and not without severe reflections on his meanness and injustice of contending for it. He accused me to the ministry as being the great obstacle to the king's service, preventing, by my influence in the house, the proper form of the bills for raising money, and he instanced this parade with my officers as proof of my having an intention to take the government of the province out of his hands by force. He also applied to Sir Everard Falconer, the postmaster-general, to deprive me of my office, but it had no other effect than to procure from Sir Everard a gentle admonition. Notwithstanding the continual wrangle between the governor and the house in which I, as a member, had so large a share, there still subsisted a civil intercourse between that gentleman and myself, and we never had any personal difference. I have sometimes since thought that his little or no resentment against me, for the answers it was known I drew up to his messages, might be the effect of professional habit, and that, being bred a lawyer, he might consider us both as merely advocates for contending clients in a suit, he for the proprietaries, and I for the assembly." He would, therefore, sometimes call, in a friendly way, to advise with me on difficult points, and sometimes, though not often, take my advice. We acted in concert to supply Braddock's army with provisions, and when the shocking news arrived of his defeat, the governor sent in haste for me, to consult with him on measures for preventing the desertion of the back counties. I forgot now the advice I gave, but I think it was that Dunbar should be written to and prevailed with, if possible, to post his troops on the frontiers for their protection, till, by reinforcements from the colonies, he might be able to proceed on the expedition. And, after my return from the frontier, he would have had me undertake the conduct of such an expedition with provincial troops for the reduction of Fort Duchesne, Dunbar and his men being otherwise employed, and he proposed to commission me as general. I had not so good an opinion of my military abilities as he professed to have, and I believe his professions must have exceeded his real sentiments. But, probably, he might think that my popularity would facilitate the raising of the men, and my influence in assembly, the grant of money to pay them, and that, perhaps, without taxing the proprietary estate. Finding me not so forward to engage as he expected, the project was dropped, and he soon after left the government, being superseded by Captain Denny. End of chapter 17